Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Exploring the Value of IAC Dental CT Accreditation. My name is Kelly Baer and I'm the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, make sure the left side panel is clicked open. At the bottom of the left panel, click on the Q&A icon, and the questions panel will appear. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar, as we will be monitoring questions throughout the presentation, and we'll try to answer as many of them as possible during the Q&A period. Also at the bottom of the left side panel is the resources icon. Click on this icon for links to today's handout, which will include a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select the name of the file to initiate download of the handout. Lastly, in the lower left, please note the home icon. If you experience any technical problems during the course of this webinar, you may click this icon. A tab labeled technical support will list a brief FAQ along with the phone number for webinar support. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, look to the right of the slides and click the tab labeled open. There you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for the ADA CERP CE credit, you must be registered, logged into this webinar, then complete the survey from the IAC Pro Library site. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, please be sure you are also registered and logged into this webinar on your own computer so that we have record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. This presentation is intended to help dental practices gain a better understanding of the value of IAC accreditation. And now I would like to introduce Mary Lally, IAC Deputy CEO and Director of Accreditation for CT Dental, who will tell us about today's guest speakers. Mary? Well, thank you, Kelly. I want to welcome and thank everyone for joining us today for the presentation. I hope that you will find the information valuable as we explore the clinical quality and safety aspects involved in the use of cone beam CT. I am very excited to introduce our two guest speakers today that are experts in the field in the use of cone beam CT technology and radiation safety. Our first speaker is Dr. Alan Farman. Dr. Farman is a board certified specialist in oral maxillofacial facial radiology and serves on the IAC CT board as a representative for the American Academy of Oral Maxillofacial facial radiology. Our second speaker is Bob Pizzatello. Bob is a board certified medical physicist with over 35 years of experience. He is the senior vice president of Landauer Medical Physicist and he is the secretary on the IAC CT board of directors. After Dr. Farman and Bob give their presentations, I will follow up with the history and structure of the IAC and give a very brief introduction to the IAC Dental Accreditation Program. As well, uh, we will entertain some questions. So without further delay, I will turn over the presentation to Dr. Farman. Dr. Farman? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here um, and thank everybody who is participating in this uh, webinar. My disclosures are that I'm a board certified oral and maxillofacial radiologist, a specialty licensed in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Uh, I am also on the IACCT Board of Directors. I'm a professor at the University of Liberal Schools of Dentistry and Medicine. I'm founder and organizer of the International Congress on Computed Maxillofacial Imaging and AOMR voting representative to the DICOM Standards Committee and ADA Codes Maintenance Committee. Uh, I also participate in ADA and AOMR Cone Beam CT continuing education courses. First of all, I'll be talking about uh, accreditation as a quality assurance activity first and foremost. We're not doing this primarily uh, to 
uh, pass some uh, guidance uh, examination, but essentially to provide the best services for our patients. Reporting of findings. The best way to know how to report findings properly is to get education, and education in cone beam CT is necessary to maximize quality and diagnostic yield. This program has been approved for one credit hour of ADA SERP, which will be provided by the American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology for participants in this seminar. In shortly more than one decade, the number of available maxillofacial cone beam CT units has grown dramatically in number. Acceptance by the dental profession has been rapid, but few users were trained in this technology during their dental education. Here are some examples of the many current cone beam CT products available commercially in the United States. In fact, there are well over 30 products presently available that uh, can be considered to be cone beam CT. It's pretty obvious that uh, in order to use these different machines, one doesn't just need a generic course, uh, which can be given by the American Dental Association and AAOMAR, but also needs to be trained by the individual uh, vendor of the machine in the specific uh, techniques. And therefore, one of the requirements for accreditation is a minimum of four hours of hands-on training in each of the systems that uh, will be used. Despite the variations in appearance, all of these cone beam CT systems are based on the same fundamental principles. They can provide 3D image data sets and are subject to similar constraints and artifact. This just shows schematically how cone beam CT works. It's cone beam because there's a divergent beam from the anode. And uh, that divergent beam is comparable to uh, every uh, periapical or uh, other uh, radiographic technique that one uses to produce two-dimensional images. But the difference is that there's a rotation of at least 180 degrees, and that during that rotation, there are anything between 150 and 1,000 two-dimensional images collected that are then Tomas synthesized together in a computer to create uh, a 3D uh, data set that can be visualized as three-dimensional anatomy. The system is a cone beam because of the beam geometry, and it is computed tomography because it uses tomographic theory and uses a computer to convert these to the data sets. Annual inspection of the facility is something which is necessary for accreditation. Regular inspection of equipment by a medical physicist is key for control to assure diagnostic image quality and also for optimizing exposure factors to help reduce patient dose to as low as reasonably achievable. The American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology Executive Opinion Statement on Performing and Interpreting Diagnostic Cone Beam Computed Tomography states that purchasers of cone beam CT have a moral and possibly legal obligation to maximize the diagnostic yield from use of ionizing radiation on their patients. Let's now consider the issue of occult or incidental findings. All diagnostic images that are performed must be reported upon, including occult or incidental findings. Reports should be made in a timely manner, and findings are the immediate consequence to help communicate it effectively to the patient. Sample reports are audited as part of the reaccreditation process, which includes the contents of the reports and issues related to how timely these reports are and whether important findings are adequately communicated. Let's have a look at some reportable findings. Here are a few examples. 
first example we can look at here is a male aged 44 for whom uh, implants were being planned for the maxillary incisor sites, uh, the uh, right lateral and the left central incisor specifically. The panoramic view shows a mucous extravasation phenomenon or pseudocyst in the left maxillary sinus. That's in the upper panoramic uh, view on the uh, left side of the screen. If we go below that, there is the actual slice, which shows a contrabullosa of the left middle turbinate and nasal septum being deviated to the left. The coronal view on the right side of the screen uh, again shows the contrabullosa of the left middle turbinate and the mucous extravasation phenomenon in the left maxillary sinus. While contrabullosa, deviated nasal septum, and mucus so pseudocyst are reportable findings, they do not need urgent follow-up as they are unlikely to affect treatment of this patient who is imaged for dental implant placement. Here's another case. This is a female age 36 that as a teenager had wisdom teeth removed. She's had a sequence of uh, problems uh, associated with the maxillary sinuses uh, uh, considered to be recurrent sinus infections. Again, there is a dome-shaped radio opacity in the left maxillary sinus. But if we look at the right side of the screen at the actual uh, view and we look at the right maxillary sinus on the left side of, of that view, we can see that the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus on that side is intact and the sinus is clear. Whereas on the left side, there is a discontinuity of the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. It's been completely eroded away. So while this is a dome-shaped uh, uh, soft tissue radiopacity, we have to be concerned about this patient, and this patient will indeed require immediate referral. While the lesion in the left maxilla has a smooth dome-shaped surface similar to a mucosal pseudocyst, this is a very different case where there is cortical erosion of the lateral and interior walls of the maxillary sinus and total effacement of the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus features pointing towards a diagnosis of malignancy. This case needs immediate referral for tests to determine the definitive diagnosis and treatment. Another patient, a male, age 66, again uh, seen for, in this case, uh, planning the placement of implants in the anterior mandible. There are in the upper view, uh, that's the coronal uh, slab, MIT, uh, uh, MPI rather, and the views of, uh, of the uh, tonsil areas which show flocular calcifications. These are clearly seen to be anterior to the uh, oropharynx, and these are tonsil lips. Tonsil lips do not need referral unless there are features of active tonsillitis. They may have consequences for the patient in terms of halitosis. They are still reportable. Misdiagnosis or lack of diagnosis could lead to unnecessary referral and evoke unwarranted concern for the patient prior to correct diagnosis. One of the areas well uh, viewed in cone beam uh, CT of the neck and the mandible is that of the bifurcation of the carotid arteries where one can commonly find uh, carotid calcified atheroma uh, in individuals who have uh, vascular disease. This shows a three-dimensional reconstruction uh, on the right side uh, with the blue arrow of such a case of carotid calcification. The next slide shows the axial view on the left side of the screen, which shows a annular calcification on the right side of the patient 
and a more diffuse calcification on the left side. One of the areas, both areas are of concern. The one with diffuse calcification may be of greater concern because of the possibility of a carotid aneurysm. Calcified carotid atheroma can lead to stroke and may indicate systemic associations such as poorly controlled diabetes 2 and renal osteodystrophy. Duplex Doppler ultrasound is indicated to investigate blood flow in the carotid arteries in the neck. This requires referral to the patient's physician for the needed workup. Other calcifications uh, can be seen in this view. If we look at the uh, uh, left side of the screen, the blue arrow points to a calcification in the middle of the brain, and this uh, is the pineal region, and calcifications here are found physiologically in about 50% of individuals aged 50 years and older. One would only refer this if this is symptomatic or if it is larger than one centimeter in size. The green arrow points to the stylohyoid ligament calcification, not as many of my students think the carotid artery. If we look to the uh, right side of the screen, the blue arrow again points to a pineal calcification. However, the red arrow points to a calcification in the pituitary fossa. Uh, this needs referral as it can be indicative of pituitary tumors. A completely occluded sinus with soft tissue or fluid radiopacity needs ear, nose, and throat referral. Differentials include infection, mucosal, and neoplasia. If we look to the uh, fully occluded uh, uh, side, that is what really re requires referral. On the um, right side of the patient, the left side of the image, there is a partial filling of the maxillary sinus with meniscus that is consistent with acute sinusitis. So, so much for some of the incidental findings that can be significant, uh, either directly to the patient's health or to the patient's concern if something insignificant is misdiagnosed and the patient left dangling for a week or two before they get a definitive diagnosis. There are also a number of projection artifacts that uh, can be found in cone beam CT. And so I'd like to just present a cautionary example or two of these projection artifacts. Here's an example. A panoramic reconstruction shows an edentulous premolar and canine segment for the left maxilla. But the transaxial section suggests multiple endodontically filled teeth are present in that same site. Here's a close-up of those uh, views. The transaxial again suggests that there are or may be a tooth actually in the, uh, the area that's totally edentulous. And this is due to artifact. Again, various different positions through that edentulous area show something that looks very much like an endodontically treated tooth. The cause of this, uh, shown by the blue arrow, is actually streak artifact that just happened to be uh, along that particular uh, area of the maxilla and showed up in all of the views. The apparent dentin, in fact, was a bite block that was used for the patient to bite on during the procedure, and that created this appearance of a tooth that does not exist in reality. Another action that can occur during cone beam CT, especially in patients who have a lot of heavily filled teeth, is that of beam hardening artifact. And because of this beam hardening artifact, uh, I would suggest not using cone beam CT for dental caries assessment and being very careful to 
judge uh, whether dental caries is present from cone beam CT, especially in individuals who have a lot of restorations. The blue arrow uh, points to a tooth that is uh, perfectly um, free from dental caries, but appears to have a radiolucency because of such artifact. Well, so much for artifact and for incidental findings. Public concern has been raised about radiation, especially since the NCRP report number 160. In the early 1980s, it was calculated that for the average American, roughly 15% of the radiation dose per year came from medical and dental uh, uses of radiation. By 2006, due to increased use mainly of CT and of uh, nuclear medicine, medical contribution to the radiation dose for the average American had risen to 48%. Additionally, there have been issues related to routine use of radiation and in uh, Two years ago, in the New York Times, an article was published that uh, questions uh, the use of radiation for children in dentist chairs, not only from cone beam CT, but from all dental uses of radiation. And unfortunately, a few individuals uh, indicated that they were using cone beam CT for every patient, uh, irrespective of having uh, an appropriate history and professional judgment based upon the individual case. Certainly, development of imaging selection criteria and procedures should precede the uh, use of cone beam CT. Um, and professional judgment is the, is the hallmark of, of all selection. There are some cone beam CT use guidelines available at the moment. There are general guidelines available from the American Dental Association Council on Scientific Affairs. And also an excellent uh, resource in Europe called Sedentex CT, which provides several hours of training in, and, and uh, information about the safe use of cone beam CT in dentistry. The American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology has also provided some very specific use guidelines. For instance, it worked with the American Association of Endodontics to produce guidelines for use of cone beam CT in endodontics. It's also recently provided guidelines for uh, use of cone beam CT in orthodontics. And there is a recent uh, 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 guideline as well for implant planning. All of these are freely downloadable at www.aomr.org and they are free to print and distribute as well because the Academy has held the uh, copyright for these and is uh, providing that free service and the ability to, without changing the text, to reproduce these guidelines. So the, the big key is professional judgment and developing professional judgment which requires evaluating each patient and deciding what radiographs are necessary. For all patients we should be image wisely, imaging wisely. For children in particular we should be imaging gently by child sizing dose for children and adolescents because they are more sensitive to radiation than our adults. Their cells are turning over more uh, rapidly and they have a longer life expectancy during which uh, untoward effects may follow. So the use of professional judgment is important and uh, this is now supported in the alliance by the American Dental Association, the American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, the American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology, the American Association of Pediatric Dentistry, uh, and the American Association of Endodontics, among other groups. In 
conjunction with the American Dental Association, the American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology has developed a basic level one and two certification training courses that fulfill all of the educational requirements for the IACCT initial accreditation, accepting only the four hours per machine training from the manufacturer for each system that you would be using. Information about these con uh, continuing education courses are to be found on the ADA and the AOMR websites. In summary, accreditation is required by CMS and by some states for imaging centers using cone beam CT. The Intersocietal Accreditation Commission, the IACCT board, is the organization set up to accredit maxillofacial and dental CBCT. Courses for cone beam CT continuing education requirements are available from the American Dental Association in association with the American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology and will be run several times in 2014. Thank you for attention to my portion of the course. Thanks, Alan. This is Bob Pizzitello, and I'm going to speak for the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes following four points. What is a medical physicist? I'll talk about the growing role of CBCT in dental imaging, in particular with attention to radiation dose, image quality, and see a medical physicist is helpful in this area. I'll spend a few moments on our primary a primer on what the word dose means in imaging, and finally, what a medical physicist can do for your practice, because the role of the medical physicist is an integral part of the Intersystem Accreditation Program. My name is Bob Pizzitello, and uh, here are my disclosures. I'm a board-certified medical physicist, <clears throat> and um, I'm a member of the Societal Accrediting Commission's Board of the Directors and currently serve as the Secretary of the Board, Senior Vice President for Landauer Medical Phys Physics, and uh, we also have a three-hour CT radiation safety course available online. Landauer Medical Physics, just to know, is a Landauer organization that many people know for its occupational monitor, and we have a medical physics practice with well over 100 medical physics physicists nationwide. So what is a medical physicist and how can we help you? My role in the Intersystem Accreditation Mission Board is that of one of the representatives from the American Association of Physicists in Medicine. So what I've shown here is a little clip from the AAPM website that says, you know, who we are and how we can... A responsibility of a qualified medical physicist clinical practice is to assure the safe and effective delivery of radiation to achieve a diagnostic or result as prescribed in patient care. The medical physicist performs or supervises the technical aspects of procedures necessary to achieve this objective. So we're not the individuals who actually take the images, who acquire the images on patients, but we're responsible for only the overall quality and safety of the and the radiation that's that's delivered. Essentially, what imaging fit do is we optimize image quality and radiation dose. So these responsibilities of the physicist include a number of items that are listed here. I'm taking a minute to go over this because, in my experience, most dental practitioners have had limited interaction with medical physicists. You may have had someone come through your office and sort of a state-mandated testing of your traditional radiographic equipment. That may person may be a medical physicist, but may not be, it's because the requirements are generally looser for those kinds of, of state inspections. So what, a, what an imaging physicist does is we're responsible for assuring protection of the paid others from potentially harmful or excessive radiation. We make sure that the protocols that are established are appropriate. We measure and characterize the radiation in the beam, and we do the delivered radiation dose, nuances associated with it, which I'll skim over in a few more minutes. We're responsible for developing and directing the quality assurance program 
In a nutshell, how do we work together to assure that the image quality that's on the day the brand new piece of, of equipment is delivered, and the physicist has said, yes, it's working just right, how do we assure that that image quality is consistent day after day after day so that every patient gets the same benefit? We work with other healthcare professionals to optimize the balance between the beneficial and the various effects of radiation, and we have a lot of expertise in the area of regulatory compliance. The definition of a qualified physicist is available here in handout, which you can refer to afterwards. Medical physicists have one of four or more of four specialty areas in which they practice. The majority of us practice in radiation oncology and are not experts in imaging, but among those who are expert in imaging, there are also others who are expert in nuclear medicine and others who are expert in the medical health, which is the health and safety aspects. <clears throat> the APM policy uh, position says that a qualified physicist is an individual who has earned her doctoral degree in an appropriate field and has been granted certification in a specific subfield by the American by one of the boards that the uh, that is approved. The uh, certification boards approved are shown at the bottom of the slide: the American Board of Radiology, American Board of Medical Physics, or the Canadian College of Physicists in Medicine. So why is radiation dose and quality a concern to me as a practitioner? Well, CT, significance radiation dose to the public, there have been numerous New York Times articles over the past couple of years, and every time another one comes up, the phones start to ring in every office that I know of that offers imaging, and especially CT. Patients are asking questions. They often come to the practice pages they've printed off the Internet, and, uh, and it's important that practitioners be able to answer those questions or have access to a medical physicist who can do that. <clears throat> there are state regulations emerging that relate to CT and dose reporting, and, and they're going to grow. There's also some flawed science out kind of alert you to, and there may be reimbursements down the line in other areas outside of dentistry there has been a requirement introduced to have accreditation in order for insurance carriers to pay claims. So obviously, if you're on this call, you're one of the many who have seen that the role of cone beam CT has become an integral one to the, to the practice of, of dentistry and dental general. The regulatory world, and in fact, most medical physicists are most familiar with the large whole body CT scanners. But as Alan mentioned, there are now many, many options available for dental practitioners to acquire specific CTs for your practice. And there are many advantages to those cone beam CT scanners. The, uh, the irradiated field of view can be reduced to the region of interest. And remember, by the way, that only mechanical or lead collimation can re reduce the radios to the patient. Electronic masking does not reduce the dose to the patient. And this slide just shows a couple of examples. There are differences and similarities. The big multi-detector CT, MDCT, that we see in hospitals, and the containers that are used in your practices. Uh, I thought I would just throw in a couple of examples of those New York Times articles that I mentioned a moment ago. Here's an article from Walt Bogdanich from, from 2010, Radiation Offers New Cure Ways to Do Harm. And then his, his articles actually continued from 2009 up through 2011, more than a dozen such articles. And it's not just the New York Times, actually on vacation in uh, a small Adirondacks of New York, found that this article had been picked up by the Adirondack Daily Enterprise, which is now only published once a week. So all your patients are seeing these articles. The major concerns about radiation are in general, are about CT and interventional procedures. Obviously, it's important for this group. And uh, the American College of Radiology published a white paper. And as Alan mentioned, the growth of CT has been dramatic. So the number of CT exams shown here in 80 were about 3 million. In 2005, were 60 million. And the numbers have increased, and now we're over 70 million CT scans per year. The National Council of Radiation Protection, as Alan mentioned, uh, assessed, uh, addressed it and about the impact of CT radiation on the population radiation dose. And this 
picked up by the media. Once it's picked up by the media, then you states start to implement legislation or regulation in this regard. So California is one state, but other states as well that have requirements for facilities providing CT scanning. I'd like to say a few words about the radiation dose issue, dosimetry, and this will be just a teeny bit technical for a few minutes. The units that most of us grew up with, if we were, if we grew up in the 70s or earlier, were that we used the, the Renkin as the unit of exposure in our <clears throat> but now we also have new units. The CTDI is the unit that we see a lot and is often misrepresented as the dose to a patient. It is not. CTDI is the computed tomography dose index, and really it's the dose to a 16 or a 32 centimeter diameter acrylic fan, the actually values that we measured. You will also see reference to terms called the effective dose or units of millis, and those are calculated, not, not, um, not measured quantities. So the old units were RADs and RADs, and new units are GRADs and sievert the international units. And the way I remember these is that a sievert is like a dollar and is like a penny. So there are 100 REM to equal one sievert. So <clears throat> some of the terms that you'll see that associated with multi-detector CTs, CT in particular, and dose length product, they really do not apply because they were not designed for cone beam CTs. Whole body CT scanners, they information such as TDI, the DLP, and their dose pages. Cone beam CT scanners have similar type displays, and I'm gonna blow up this picture in the corner, which is way too small to read. So you can see that the technical factors, particularly the kilovoltage, the MMA, and the exposure, those are the essential element dose. This particular scanner also reports the CTW, which is, uh, which is one, one factor that's sometimes reported. The effective dose is a number that you'll see in the literature, and the effective dose says that you take an absorbed dose to each organ and you multiply it factor for each organ that represents its relative sensitivity to radiation. So, for example, according to the ICRP-103, the most recent weighting factors, the breast has a weighting factor of 1.2 as marrow and so on. The bladder and esophagus all have weighting factors of 0.05. The idea is you take the dose to each organ, multiply it by the weighting factor, and that gives you an equivalent to what a patient would have received if they had whole body exposure. So remember that effective dose is a calculated, not a measured quantity. It is by definition a, a measure, an est of the uniform body dose that, that would produce the same level of risk for adverse effects from non-uniform partial body irradiation, such as in a head CT. So when you see units called the sieverts, you know that you're talking about or someone is talking about effective dose. The risk of cancer induction from radiation dose ends on the organ receiving the dose. The, the most important parameter is to know the organ dose. The use of effective dose permits comparison of risks when multiple organs are irradiated. So, for example, the effective dose to a patient would be higher if a cone beam CT included the were properly collimated and excluded the thyroid because the dose to the thyroid would then be zero. So we would not add that, in, that into the effective dose calculation. So remember that medical physicists can measure dose to an organ. The risk come largely from the whole body measures from the patients as such as Hiroshima and Nagasaki. These populations, though, were a wide range of ages, they were Japanese populations with, with unique risk factors that are not the same as, as our U.S. patients. So care has to be taken in these data. The IP has published several reports with several sets of weighting factors, but how should these be used? So this slide is a, is a title slide, which you certainly can't read, but you will. The ICRP published this paper, what do their qualities mean? So I blew up a small section of the slide to say that it is clear from the approach of the ICRP that these effective dose quantities are not individual specific, but relate to reference person, a reference human being, not individual 
specific. So why is this important? Well, th- there is a uh, there are companies out there that are producing software that will produce a report with a card that you could give to your patient. That your radiation dose was in this one point two. See, that is an inappropriate use of that term. It, it's totally mixing metaphors, and it will absolutely give the patient the wrong idea. So we strongly recommend that practice is not. And if you have any questions, this is an idea to consult a physician. <clears throat> so how is cone beam CT dosimetry done? Well, in most of the research that you'll see, you'll see issues where there uh, examples where there have been phantoms, three phantoms of the head, and then within these sections of the head, very dosimeter placed to be able to get an accurate representation of the dose. So how much is the dose? This slide, I think, is very helpful. A typical CT of the maxilla and the mandible uh, might have a value of something like 240 and this would be the effect dose, so the organs affected. Compare that with a cone beam CT, which could be a good deal lower, maybe on the order of 131, with a large field of view. And then, as you can see, if you compare that with a full mouth series, a full mouth series is an order of magnitude. Wings are a very small exposure and so on. So the cone beam CT dose, while smaller than the dose from a full hospital CT scanner, is by no means. So we want to make sure that it's being used appropriately. Patients ask you a radiation dose. I have a few suggestions based on my experience. One is try to avoid a technical answer. Emphasize the benefit to the patient, the risk, and say that in your judgment, the benefit exceeds the risk. A phrase such as we the least amount of radiation we can to achieve the image quality that we need for your care or for whatever you're going to do for this patient. It's fair to say that CT doses are much lower than whole body CT scanners. You can also say that we use a board-certified medical physicist to measure and oversee our QC program, if in fact you do that. And of course, we are accredited by the Inter-Societal Accreditation Commission, again, if you're accredited. If a patient says a little bit more about, well, what do you really mean about dose? How much do you use? This works very well in my experience. Just like you need the right amount of light to do small, detailed work like needle reading small print, we need the right amount of radiation to see what we need to see in the CT. And that's the amount of radiation that we no more and no less. So in the last couple of minutes of my time, I'll just talk briefly about what a physicist does when we perform a survey, an assessment of dose and image quality. So we evaluate the dose and image quality. We compose results with regulatory and professional standards. There are some technical challenges to working with cone beam CT. So not every medical physicist that you will encounter may have experience with these. So if you're going to work with a medical physicist, I encourage you to be ask that specific question. Have you worked with cone beam CTs before? The testing protocols for cone beam CT scanners are less rigidly standardized than they are for hospital type whole body CT scanners. So the medical physicist needs to be a those standards. The medical physicist then issues a report and the route has to follow the guidelines that we have developed and put up on the IAC website. So we have guidance documents for the radiation survey, which is done one quality and dose reports for each annual survey. And I would encourage you to make, download those documents or have your physicist so they know what is expected of them. Phantom images are required in the annual medical physical. The physicists participate in the QC committee meetings that are specified in the standards. You must have a three-hour CT radiation safety training course for any individual who operates the scanners and who is not a registered technologist. And your medical physicist can help you with and this define a medical physicist as an individual who is board certified or in states where they are licensed, registered, or otherwise approved to do work on CT scanners. So a service engineer, for example, is not a medical physicist and use them to meet that requirement. 
So medical physicists, for example, are involved in reading the literature. So here's a, a, a couple of interesting photos of how different ways that resolution is measured in cone beam CT scanners and how they compare with, with whole body CT scanners. Your medical physicist should be aware of that. This slide shows one example of the different types of phantoms that we place on the device in order to make radiation measurements. We also make measurements of the extent of the radiation beam to make sure that the radiation is not exceeding the receptor and unnecessary radiation to the patient. So in summary, what we've talked about is what is a medical physicist? There are not very many of them, uh, maybe a couple of thousand in the country. Um, but these are people to your practice if, if you're going accredited. You want to make sure you have a medical physicist who has expertise in imaging and particularly in cone beam CT. Because cone beam CT is growing, it's very important to have the role of a physicist to help you assure dose, image quality, and consistency. We've talked about the different dose units. I've obviously done this fairly quickly. This is another area where your medical physicist can help. And finally, we've talked about how the medical physicist can be of assistance to your practice. I encourage you to, to utilize the medical physicist and to progress toward rotation. So now to progress towards accreditation, I'd like to hand off to Mary Lally. Mary? Oh, well, thank you, Bob. And thanks, Dr. Farman, for your very informative presentations today relating to image quality and safety, both very important in the use of cone beam CT in the dental practice. Now, as Bob indicated, I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about the accreditation process and about who the IAC is. The IAC, or the Intersocietal Accreditation Commission, is a nonprofit organization that has been offering voluntary accreditation for more than 20 years. The IAC has over 12,000 sites currently accredited, and we are fully recognized by CMS and other private payers. The IEC is the only imaging accreditation organization to offer cone beam CT accreditation and is also the only imaging accreditation organization to earn the status of ISO certification. We're very happy to have achieved that. So we know what applicant facilities are going through by meeting certain standards. So as you can see here, the IEC is comprised of five diagnostic imaging divisions and two are therapeutic. Dental CT is currently listed in our CT program, but has its own separate standards and website. You can see our first program started in vascular testing in 1990, and with the success of this program, we've added on our other diagnostic modalities, such as echocardiography, nuclear medicine and PET, MRI, CT, dental CT, carotid scenting, and vein center, which are our newest therapeutic divisions. There is leadership from each of these boards that's comprised our IAC Oversight Board of Directors, and then there are specialists from each of these divisions that comprise the Division Board of Directors. This slide depicts our CT sponsoring organizations. As you can see, we have the dentist representation as well as the physicists listed here, as well as other medical specialists involved in CT imaging. Now this group of clinical experts write the standards or the guidelines, revise them as necessary, and they review the applications to render the final decision for applicant facilities. So why do facilities apply for accreditation? What is the value? Well, as we just heard from Bob and Alan and Dr. Farman, accreditation is a way for facilities to demonstrate to the patients that are committed to quality imaging and patient care by meeting standards that are created by their peers. Quality facilities are responsible for maintaining compliance with the standards and will be assessed for doing so at the time of audit or site visit. It's important to understand that achieving accreditation is not a static exercise. It is one meant to be a continuous process improvement tool. Hopefully you'll find that as you work through the program. And as alluded to earlier, there are, although accreditation was started from a, for a voluntary reason uh, as a peer review process of the quality and safety that is in your facility or a dental practice, there are payment policies that are requiring accreditation. And most notably is the MIPA law of 2008, 
which required nuclear medicine PET, MRI, and CT, including dental CT units, to be accredited by January 1, 2012, to receive Medicare reimbursement. There were also private payers and state programs, as alluded to earlier, California and Minnesota, and various private insurers may require accreditation. I encourage you to check with your um, billing administrator to see how to go about to, to make sure that they, those requirements don't apply to you, or if they do. So how do you go about applying for accreditation? Well, the first thing you want to do is go to our website, intersocietal.org forward slash dental, and there is a lot of information, but to get started, you want to go and download the standards. The standards out are broken into a uh, um, outline form, so any place that you want to look at, you certainly can click on that link and go directly to that. You can see that there, the standards will guide you um, to the requirements for the dental and technical staff, uh, their training experience requirements that must be met in order to apply for accreditation. There are patient employee safety policies, which are very important, as we all know. There's equipment QC processes that must be followed, as well as radiation oversight and safety adherence in general. There are report content items, as well as in quality improvement program that must be part of the accreditation process. Also, case studies or images will be evaluated, as well as the report accuracy and content. The application is fully online, and the application is a yes or no, or fill in a blank, or upload the documents as the standards are written. On any web page of the Dental CT website, you can access the online accreditation. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over the exact um, ways to apply for accreditation, but I want to tell you that we're here to help. On the website, we have a lot of reference for, references for you to use. We have sample policies and procedures. We have sample reports and report content items. We also give you a QC and a quality improvement um, policy to follow, as well as some physicist guidance documents that you want to give to your physicist. There's a nice checklist for you to use as you work through the program. And all of this is meant to help guide you. It may seem like a big undertaking, but if you chunk it down in little parts and get everything together first by using the checklist, when you get to the application, it's merely, you know, again, yes or no, fill in the blank, uh, upload the document, and send it to the IEC. Once you do obtain accreditation, you'll, there's a full marketing kit and certificates that are available for you as well as door clings and press releases, and we have a marketing uh, communications department that can help you with that. Now, given the time constraints, again, uh, there's a lot more to the IEC Dental CT Accreditation Program. Um, I encourage you to join our complimentary webinar on December 17th at 1 o'clock, and if you have any inf need any more information, you certainly can email us or call us when I show you the slide in the meantime. And I want to thank everyone for participating in the dental uh, CT webinar today. Kelly's going to take over and tell you how to get that um, credit, and then we'll open it up to questions and answers. Okay. Um, we will have the uh, Q&A session here shortly, but uh, before we do, I'm going to um, read you a few instructions. Um, Make sure, uh, let's see, um, to receive your continuing education credit for attending this webinar, uh, please make sure you complete the survey, which will appear on your screen concluding this session. And it's also available at the IACProLibraries.com website. In the upper left, you'll click on My Webinars. Look for the title of this session, Exploring the Value of IAC Dental CT Accreditation. And then beneath this title, you will see the link Take Evaluation. Click this link to complete your survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and anytime thereafter through a new link on the My Webinars page called View Certificate. So at this time, we'll begin the Q&A session. Mary, you want to start us off? Sure. Thank you, Kelly. Okay. We have some questions here, and this question is for Alan. What are ways to make potential Cone beam CT users or buyers 
about those considerations with risk and estimate. Uh, since we have to accept that buyers are looking for most of a profit margin while embarking on purchase of such a scanner. Hmm. Interesting question. Um, I would agree that uh, the number of radiologists uh, such uh, that uh, our ability to communicate is is restricted, but the American Dental Association is an enormous organization representing 165,000 dentists, 135,000 whom, of whom are active at the moment and receive uh, documents such as ADA News and the Journal of the American Dental Association. Um, obviously, uh, we can't do it alone, um, but with the ADA and with the other dental specialty groups that have joined us, such as the oral and maxillofacial surgeons and the uh, pediatric dentists, endodontists, and periodontologists, uh, who are also uh, part now of the Image Gently Alliance, I think that together we should be able to communicate the needs to uh, our professional membership. Um, as far as the manufacturers are concerned, uh, to all intents, as far as I can see, they're also very keen to uh, promote the idea of very low doses and uh, trying to get the lowest dose um, applications that are possible. In fact, in some cases, perhaps to too great an extent, um, that is, that uh, when one reduces the dose too much, they, there's not a diagnostic image left. I think the biggest issue is one of uh, maintaining a professional standard in which the public expects that they will be inspected by a uh, dentist before dental radiographs are taken, that they're not taken prior to uh, meeting the dentist as a routine, but are based upon the, their individual needs. And um, maybe the insurance companies need to be part of this as well. You know, we have to uh, have a uh, reason for uh, doing certain procedures in terms of restoring teeth, and maybe we should uh, be held accountable for the reasons uh, for taking the images on, on our patients. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, it should not be a routine every time. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks for that answer, Dr. Farman. And now we have one for Bob. Is a health physicist the same as a medical physicist? Well, that's a great question. Uh, the answer is not really. A, a health physicist is an individual who is trained in health and key aspects of the use of radiation. So, for example, they would be very capable of making measurements to say, is it safe for your staff to be in this location near a near an X-ray producing machine or not? Or they could help you interpret use and badge results. However, a health physicist by by itself is not necessarily expert in medical imaging. In the American Board of Health Physics exam, there are no questions about medical imaging. In fact, there are a few questions about medicine in general. So health physicists are knowledgeable about radiation, but if you want a, a physicist who's knowledgeable about imaging and patients as well as radiation, then that's a, that individual is a medical physicist. Some individuals are both. I hope that answered your question. Okay, great. Thanks, Bob. Now we have a follow-up, Dr. Farman, to the first question. Well, giving copies of dose articles to the manufacturer, to the um, while to the buyers of the cone beam CT, the purchaser of the uh, cone beam CT machines help. So I think giving copies of dose articles to the manufacturers to give to the purchasers of the cone beam CT would. Do you think that would help? I hope would I have that help? question right. It, it, it is very difficult to know. Uh, it depends how the articles were constructed, how the research was done. Uh, just looking at doses related to manufacturers' uh, specifications of exposure is probably not the best way to do this. Uh, one needs to 
uh, consider the image quality uh, for the particular task at hand and and the, uh, the the average doses from just one mannequin may be very different or two mannequins may be very different from the actual dose that is absorbed by any individual patient uh, uh, given different circumstances what's most important is to uh, minimize the number of radiographs that are taken to those that are absolutely necessary and minimize the dose while doing that, but not to a point below which images are of no diagnostic utility. There are a number of articles that are out at the moment that have caveats that say, yes, we can reduce the dose if we use the manufacturer's specifications, but we need to have further uh, studies to evaluate whether the image quality is adequate for the tasks that are being performed. Okay, great. I think we do we have time for one more, you think? Um, if you're willing to stay on. One being listed, listed there, yeah. uh, which yeah. is that uh, would uh, private practices hire a medical physicist to come to the office to perform a quality check? I think that Bob's already stated absolutely yes once a year. And who does the reports? Well, the reports uh, are the responsibility of the practitioner uh, who is making the radiograph or ordering the radiograph, and uh, that individual can be helped if they don't feel comfortable in making the report by uh, having a uh, overread by a, a uh, maxillofacial radiologist. There are a number of uh, of uh, systems out there at the moment or groups of individuals who will make those reads for you at relatively low prices. But uh, the, the dentist is his own radiologist, and if he doesn't wish to have such reports made by uh, somebody outside of his office, he can make them himself. Mm hmm Well, thanks. I would just add to okay. that that um, we, use the, we use the term reports in two medical physicist also provides a technical reach of their services, and that report has to be submitted to the IAC. So the question just said reports. I wanted to make sure it was we used it in two different ways in this, in this context. Right. Well, I have a question for me. How will the webinar on December 17th dif differ from this webinar? We'll go into the accreditation process in more detail. Yes, that the webinar on December 17th is specific to CT uh, accreditation. The items that apply other than the specific standards to the medical and technical staff are exactly the same for conventional CT versus uh, dental cone beam CT because there's radiation safety, there's policy and procedures of safety, pregnancy policy, and so on. So yes, it will go specific. It will show you more detail about the website, the resources, the online application, and the whole accreditation cycle and process. So yes, much more detail, and it is complimentary uh, as well. Now, we do have another one here. If I do not accept Medicare patients, this is for Dr. Farman, why should cone beam CT accreditation be worthwhile to me? <laughs> it depends upon which part of the country you're living in. There are uh, regulations that have been developed in California and Minnesota and are being talked about perhaps in New York in the future, which will require all individuals who have so-called advanced imaging uh, centers, which includes cone beam CT, to be accredited in order to use the equipment. Um, why is it useful to you? Well, IACCT has existed for many, many, many years. made its ruling that there must be accreditation for Medicare. So the main reason for having accreditation is to provide uh, quality assurance feedback to yourself and also to uh, demonstrate that uh, you are doing this uh, for the patient. Great. Okay, another one for Bob. Now, it is after two, so I just want to keep everybody, for those of you that want to stay on, we're willing to answer a couple more. How can I find a medical physicist in my area? I had a feeling somebody was going to ask that. <laughs> 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 if, um, if you want to just contact me offline, I'll be happy to, to uh, help you out there. There is no 
central clearhouse for medical physicists, with one exception. There is an organization, Conference of Radiation Control. Go to www.crcpd.org. There is what's called a registry of qualified medical physicists, and you can punch in your state, and you can and you can find a list there. It's not absolutely everybody, but it is everybody who is board certified or licensed. So uh, that that's a good place to start. www.crcpd.org, and search for the QMP or the Qualified Medical Physicist Registry. And if anybody needs that again, I certainly can uh, email me. I'll get it out to you as well. Okay. Well, last question here. And again, thank you all for your patience. This is for Dr. Farman. I have operated a comb beam CT for more than five years and was trained to use a system by the technician who made the installation. Why should I need to take additional continuing education to have my clinic accredited for comb beam CT use? Uh, good question. The technician placing the equipment probably did not uh, have the background to train you thoroughly in selection of to be used for particular tasks, probably did not have the background to be able to tell you or train you in how to interpret the images that you are taking, uh, and uh, probably did not uh, have the ability to demonstrate all of the artifacts that can be present from comb beam CT. The People who take the uh, hours of, of training, which are comparable to those which are required in, in Germany and Canada and are suggested by Sedentex CT in, in the United Kingdom as well, uh, have in general been very happy with what they have learned in terms of being able to expand their abilities to uh, use their system. You've spent a lot of money in buying the equipment and maximizing uh, the uh, utility of the equipment uh, requires knowledge uh, to retain your which you're going to have to take a number of continuing uh, hours of education and uh, if you've invested in a comb beam ct machine uh, let those hours be uh, not just used for IACCT, but used for your continuing education requirement for dentistry, for your license, and uh, to extend your knowledge and to help you better use the equipment that you've invested in, in purchasing. Uh, we've had very good feedback from the participants in the courses to such an extent that the American Dental Association has uh, been asking for, for many more of these courses. So I, I guess that uh, those who have taken the courses think that they got something of value, not just for uh, getting IACCT accreditation, but for for benefiting themselves in in, in their uh, value uh, return and ability to use the machines that they've purchased. Okay, Alan, well, Bob, okay. may I just add one one comment to that, please? Um, I Manufacturers absolutely are required to stay away from anything that looks like the professional practice of medicine or dentistry. They're not allowed to do that. So they're great at showing you how to operate their equipment and use But what we're talking about in terms of these training programs and also the radiation safety training program is now more about professional practice, and that is not within the purview of a manufacturer's installing individual. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, well, this concludes our presentation. I want to thank everyone for joining us. I want to thank our speakers, Dr. Alan Farman and Bob Pizzatello, for giving us insightful and, and a good overview of the value of clinical quality and safety in comb beam CT. Please take your survey so you can get your certificate. That will be sent to you shortly. Thank you all, and have a good afternoon.